ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me welcome you. Thank you for joining us for the discussions which promise to be lively and insightful. The topic of, the, of our discussions are broad enough. It's about the US election results and its impact on the US-Georgia future strategic partnership. Of course, within the next hour, it would be impossible to cover the broad range of issues, but, but we'll try to give you some guides, some insights. We're extremely pleased having a distinguished uh, speakers and uh, distinguished, uh, distinguished scholars, but who are uh, Dr. Richard White, uh, who is the senior fellow and director of the Center for Political and Military Analysis at Hudson Institute, and uh, Dr. Uh, James Carafano, who is a leading expert in national security foreign policy challenges, uh, and who is the vice president of Heritage Catherine and Shelby Callum Davis Institute for national security foreign policy. So, uh, uh, and we have a fellow uh, colleague of mine from GeoCase, uh, which is a Tbilisi think tank, and I myself, I'm a chair for GeoCase, Dr. Katuna Burkata. So welcome all to these discussions and hopefully the audience will enjoy an exchange of, of, of views. Uh, uh, well, uh, let's assume that, um, well, I, I very much appreciate that the elections, uh, the presidential elections is still in flux, but uh, I make an assumption that the president-elect becomes the president of the United States. And that being said, uh, just few opening statements to, to, to guide the discussions that uh, it was once said that the foreign policy shifts on the Trump presidency will be driving the next US president. So it's, it's a big question uh, for all of us, uh, what those shifts were and would they be repeated? Can you deepen those uh, shifts would, uh, how deep those shifts, shifts, uh, shifts would be under the next presidency? It's also the question if uh, Biden's selection uh, signals return to the so-called normalcy, informal relations, normalcy as we knew it, after considering uh, and taking into account the fact that the U.S. is so polarized, and if I'm not mistaken, it was the Republican control Senate. My uh, next observation is that the uh, uncertainty by Wall and European leaders as to what Biden may ask of them, especially in the knowledge that he may be a one-time president, that's also an issue from my standpoint, and the closing observation that all in all an expectation is that to a certain degree uh, civility we expect under the Biden's administration, albeit another controversial time in uh, these days, but still you know that a certain normalcy, a certain civility could be restored or will be restored under the Biden's presidency. And that the United States will increase its role as the convening global nation for various multinational uh, initiatives. So um, that being said, it's my, my pleasure to go to our distinguished panelists and distinguished uh, experts. I will start with uh, uh, Dr. Carafano. So Dr. Carafano, your um, insight, your uh, views, please, um, uh, and then we'll go uh, down the road. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It is always a privilege for us to engage with our Georgian colleagues and, and talk about transatlantic issues. Um, I, I'm not gonna presume the outcome of the election. You know, I'll, I'll just make the point that the world doesn't change because the US has elections. The geopolitics remain kind of the same. And I, I, we tend to pretend that the, next, that the next day you get a completely different foreign policy. And, and I don't think that's true. So let me talk about the elements of continuity and change. And then Richard, my good colleague there can can talk about what some of the, the shifts might be. So let me focus on the continuities. I think the, the, the notion of a Europe whole, free, and prosperous, that is a general bipartisan consensus in Washington, D.C. And the notion that Georgia is part of the solution of that, that Georgia is part of the greater European community, and the integration of Georgia into the larger European community is, is part of a path to a, a long-term uh, stability and prosperity. I think that's commonly shared uh, across uh, both sides of the aisle, and I think that stays the same. Uh, the other point I would make is uh, I think that American support for NATO was, was never in question. Uh, 
uh, it remains, regardless of the outcome of the election, um, the, the pillar of the American conception of its contribution to transatlantic collective security. Uh, I, I don't actually think there was a declement of that at all uh, in the last four years. And in many ways, I think there were some very strong positives. I think one of the most important points is the recognition that, uh, that NATO is a political military alliance. And we tend to focus a lot on the military role of stability, and we tend not to talk as much about the political role. But the political uh, stability that NATO brings to the European and transatlantic community is equally important. And to me, the key underpinning of that is the open door uh, initiative, the, the notion that uh, NATO enlargement is never off the table and that uh, adversarial states don't get to decide or don't get a vote on the free association of nations who are interested in collective security, that that decision is made by the free nations themselves. I think the United States is committed to that. I think the last four years, we've been demonstrably strong in the open door policy. Uh, I know um, in, in our analysis of the Heritage Foundation, when we look at the long-term uh, vision of NATO, we see the, the path forward that at, that, that at some point this, this would include Georgia. If, if Georgia wanted to join NATO, it would include Ukraine. If Ukraine wanted to join NATO, if, if, if smaller countries like Kosovo wanted to join NATO, it would include that as well. Um, I think there's bipartisan support for that in the Congress. Uh, I think there's bipartisan support for that in the larger national security community. And um, I think that will remain a, a pillar of the American political um, uh, commitment to, to the alliance. Now, having said that, I don't know how quick that'll move, what that looks like, but um, you know, things have been moving in a positive direction. Uh, I think uh, another element of continuity is I think is an uh, increasingly positive view of Georgia in the United States. I think people looked at the results of the elections, they relatively perceived them as, as fair, um, that, uh, that the support for Georgia is relatively bipartisan. I think that's a, um, a, a, a strength. The other, the other area in which I, I do believe there's a, a, a degree of bipartisan consensus in the US is um, in the near term issue that we're all concerned about, which is the um, Armenian Azerbaijan conflict, um, I think in the U.S., you know, both sides would like to see uh, a, a cessation of, of uh, violence, um, a ceasefire. And, and most importantly, I think from the U.S. perspective, our number one interest, and I think this is true regardless of who the president is, is that, that the issues of Armenia and Azerbaijan do not spill over and destabilizing other countries. This, is, this has really been a key pillar of U.S. policy the last several years. If you look at our policy in Syria, for example, um, it really wasn't about Syria. It was really about ensuring that the issues in Syria don't fold, you know, don't bleed out of Syria and become destabilizing for us in Europe or other countries in the Middle East. And so it was really designed to keep the problems in Syria in Syria, you know, regardless of how the, the resolution of, of Syria worked out. Um, this is the lines, I think, and I'll, I'll just end on this. Um, you know, we, we are in an era of great power competition. I think that's bipartisan in the United States. They recognize that. Inherent is that is US is a global power with global responsibilities and global interests. We can't secure those unless we can get out of the world. So the, the, key, the key connectors of the world, everything from the Black Sea, to the South China Seas, internet, space, those are vital for the United States. And those key regions that link the United States to the world, Western Europe. And in my definition of Western Europe, it kind of starts at Moldova, Georgia, and Ukraine. Um, the greater Middle East uh, and the Indo-Pacific, that our key goal there is peace and stability. I think there's a common belief on that uh, in the American national security community. And I think that'll be true uh, in January, regardless of who the president is. Um, so I, I think that's a good place to start where for the things you can you can count on. And, and Richard could probably pick up and talk about, well, what, what things might, might change. Is that fair, Richard? Yes. Dr. Car Dr. Carfana, thank you so much indeed for your encouraging statements and thank you so much for your efforts for keeping Georgia so highly on the radar. That's really being truly and very much appreciated. So thank you so much indeed. 
Dr. Weiss, great having you. And we very much look forward to, to getting your views and your insight on the matter. Thank you. Sure, did you want to ask Jim a question before he goes off or? I think that let's, let's finish with your statements and then we'll go back with the questions, please. Okay, sure. Uh, so thank you uh, for allowing me to join. What I'll do is I'll talk a little about what could be the general policies of a Biden administration um, and I'll presume that he is most likely to be president in January, but the Democrats will not control the Senate. So we've got a bit of mix. I'll focus on you know, general policies, then a bit on a Russia, China, and Europe, uh, just as, as, as regional priorities. Um, so it's important to point out that the uh, vice president did not spent a lot of time in his campaign discussing foreign policy, um, but we can guess what it is likely to be. He had several thousand people uh, divided into about 24 groups, uh, analyzed various issues, some traditional European security, some non-traditional, such as how to promote diversity and equity in, in, the, in the US foreign policy and so on. Um, he also has had an extensive experience as vice president and as chairman of the Center Foreign Relations Committee, so he's well known to leaders. Um, generally, he is styles to seek compromise. He uh, wants to rely on expert advice rather than on his, his gut instincts. He tends to, he, he won't, he, he wouldn't use for, uh, rely on foreign policy by uh, Twitter, he would more often try and empower uh, envoys to negotiate on his behalf. Um, the uh, focus, though, at least initially of his policies, and I think we're seeing this already, is going to be on domestic affairs, especially how to manage COVID and address some of the, uh, the racial and, 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 and other uh, issues of concern to his base. Uh, but if the Senate remains in Republican hands, then the, I think the congressional deadlock is going to encourage him to focus more and more on foreign policy. And of course, events might drive him in that way in, in, any, in, in any case. If the Senate uh, is Republican, I think we'll see the uh, Vice uh, President Biden focus uh, especially on non-treaty initiatives as well as those that don't involve a lot of funding. So you can expect him pretty early to rejoin the WHO as well as resume US funding of the organization, uh, rejoin the Paris Climate Change, uh, Agreement um, through executive orders. Uh, we also think he'll use executive orders to roll back some of the immigration and refugee restrictions in line with some of the, his, his policy platform, substantially raise those quotas uh, an early task for the administration will be writing a new national security strategy and national defense strategy. The previous documents were fairly um, representative of, of the US national security consensus. They were more reflected more, I think, of the think tank community than they did, for example, of um, uh, the presidential advisors. Uh, and, but still, the new team will want to put in their own interpretation uh, and, and flush those out. I think in general, the priority for them will be China more than Russia and Europe. Though I'll focus a lot on those two because I know it's important for the Georgian audiences. And economics, including energy and climate rather than security. Uh, so this might mean that, for example, defense policies will be determined a lot within the department um, by you know, whoever they're going to have lead that uh, agency, as well as some of the other foreign, pol foreign policy agencies. With climate change, I think you're going to see a demand for uh, stronger standards. You'll see, because of the uh, Republican control of the Senate, a big focus in trying to encourage other countries to uh, take stronger reductions in emissions. Um, and, and this can be done, I think we saw Secretary Kerry, for example, in a previous administration, spent a lot of time lobbying for Paris Climate Agreement. I think you could see that from the new Secretary of State. 
but I think it's going to be impossible to find the funds to, to promote a, an extensive green energy program or some of the other ideas that some of the left-wing groups in the Democratic Party would have liked to see and that we're seeing in some European countries. With respect to um, Europe, I think that they'll be more open to NATO expansion, uh, large, larger membership, but it's still going to be a, a, a tough because of opposition within some of the European governments that will need to be overcome. You may see an early decision regarding the proposed troop withdrawal from Germany. It hasn't really been implemented, so they could reverse that, but it still then raises the question, what are you going to do with the troops that were supposed to be sent to Poland? Do you add those? Do you figure out some compensation to Poland uh, and other countries, the frontline countries that were expecting the shift? Um, you're going to see a need to do the strategic reflection process of NATO. It's still undergoing on and trying to re, re strengthen uh, alliance unity. You're seeing that run by the Secretary General in particular. I think the administration will support that. Biden's well known to NATO. Uh, you're, there's still some torn, I think there's some cross pressures within the new team. I think, for example, on Nord Stream, some of them want to try and stop it as the current administration does but others would prioritize transatlantic unity and so would be willing to let the Germans go ahead with the uh, pipeline. Um, same on Belarus, I think they're gonna be a bit torn between wanting to punish uh, Lukashenko's regime for its uh, abuses uh, versus, but, but, but others will argue, no, we shouldn't try and drive Belarus even closer to Russia. Uh, on Russia itself, you're seeing an open debate in the U.S. think tank community and former diplomats. Uh, people have been writing, signing, competing letters about to what extent an improvement in relations is, is possible and what, what should be offered. I think that in any case, the Biden team will have a freer hand um, since it's not hobbled by accusations of being pro-Putin um, but I'm not sure its policies are going to differ a lot from the actual Trump administration policies. We've seen a firm line under the current administration on sanctions, on uh, NATO defense, on putting a support for Ukraine uh, and Georgia. So I don't, I don't think there'll be a major change, even though they in theory have more options. I think the priority, at least initially, will be on uh, renewing the New START agreement. Um, people know that treaty expires in February. Um, the current administration has proposed a one-year extension with a freeze on the number of warheads. Um, the Biden team has indicated they would just, well, they were happy to renew the existing agreement by five years and then try and negotiate a new one. I think the Russians are now debating uh, whether to try and lock in the extension with the current administration before it leaves in January, or perhaps wait for a better offer in January. Uh, but in any case, that whatever they do, it's just going to push the question back by a few years, because it, it, in, even at the maximum, it's by 2016, we're going to need a new uh, treaty. And I think some of the uh, issues that have been raised by the current administration about including new types of weapons, all nuclear weapons, including the so-called tactical ones, um, as well as China, and uh, as uh, uh, that will, will need to be addressed. I think they're going to review the sanctions regime um, initially in assessment of what's working, what's not. They've been pushing this idea of smart sanctions. Um, I don't think they would go for comprehensive repeal. I think that that's much resistance in, co in Congress to that, but more optimization. There's a, some fear that sanctions have been overused and that's degraded their effectiveness. Um, and so they wanna pr make prioritize uh, what should be done. And I think there'll be fewer of any sanctions on allies. Um, they, they will try and focus them on, tar on, on direct targets of their concern. Um, we could see renewed diplomacy on Ukraine. Um, the previous administration, as we know, was hobbled on Ukraine because it got swept up into the impeachment hearings and that 
basically disabled much of the bureaucracy and, and leaders' envoys that were dealing with the country. The new team comes in with a new start, um, may want to resume the mince process, might want to resume, look for something better. They'll, of course, prioritize democracy and human rights uh, as one of their issues, which will make the Russian government extremely unhappy. Um, but I think they expect that. Um, I have some material on China and the Russia-China alignment, but maybe maybe we can go to that to question and answers if you want. I don't know how, I think, yeah, I think I've spoken the, my full time, but I, or I can go into it now. What would you prefer? Yeah, good. sure. Let's let's cover the uh, U.S.-China relationships, you know, during the Q&A. Sure. That, that should be fine. So, yeah. Sure. Okay. So the um, the, the Biden administration, I think, is going to tone down some of the rhetoric that we've seen under the current administration, uh, particularly regarding the Chinese Communist Party. That was a, a, a that that was a key theme of the current administration, attacking the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, rather than the Chinese government, because they equated the two and fell, and and so it became a very ideological struggle. Um, I think that they will not uh, de-emphasize that line, um, and but maybe promote democracy and, and and human rights more as a general factor in in Xinjiang, in uh, Hong Kong, and so on. Um, they will continue to confront Chinese policies they oppose, but they'll be more, they're going to emphasize more not just China versus the U.S., but trying to work uh, with other partners in, in institutions. Um, and so part of this will be reestablishing U.S. leadership in the WHO and the U.N. to better compete with China. Um, and then at the regional level, I don't know if they're going to return to the TPP or something better. They now have the Quad as a possible mechanism to develop. Um, but there's not some discussion of a new uh, structure, sort of a D10, Democracy 10, which would be the G7 plus Japan, South Korea, and Australia uh, as some way to deal, for example, with the 5G standards and so on. Um, Taiwan is going to be interesting. This administration leaned very forward towards Taiwan, a lot of arms sales, sending a lot of senior officials. I'm not sure if the Biden people would keep up the same high profile. They certainly would want to uh, uh, work with the Taiwanese and prom uh, promote their, their achievements in democracy and, and get them involved in global health more. But beyond that, I'm not sure. The economic competition, there's going to be less focus on tariffs, much more enthusiasm for um, working again through multilateral structures. And I think they're going to focus less on particular Chinese companies, you know, Huawei or TikTok, uh, ban one after another. And I think they're trying to look for groups. So you would establish fixed standards for data protection, um, for accountancy standards, and then companies uh, that do not comply from China would be um, subject to additional scrutiny, have to make changes, or so on. Um, their focus is, as I said, less on tariffs and on fair trade and more on domestic reforms that could strengthen econ U.S. economic competitiveness. So there's more support for industrial policy, a push to strengthen the U.S. innovation ecosystem, uh, more funding for federal R&D and basic education and the sciences, um, and that's how they do it. Um, so the interesting question is how Russia and China will react with this. And this, I just don't know. Uh, I think that it's most likely, though, the US is still going to remain the outlier in this triangle, that, that Russia and China will still have better relations with each other than with the United States. Um, but there may be areas of possible cooperation. I, I would think that uh, cl climate change was one. Even the Russians now acknowledge this to be a problem probably dealing with world health you know, uh, issues because of what's been exposed by the pandemic. They might try and uh, focus on that. With Iran, there might be areas of, uh, of cooperation if the administration, new administration tries, it goes back to the, the effort of trying to work with Russia, China, and the Europeans and to work out some kind of negotiated limits on Iranian behavior. Um, but that depends a lot on how the, the Iranians react. So that was my 
brief, brief overview, but I'm happy to go into more detail on specific issues. Dr. White, thank you so much indeed for your uh, very helpful hints and guides. And uh, <laughs> although there's not, not much time uh, given to you, but you, you've managed to cover you know, a broad array of issues. So <laughs> that's been very helpful indeed. And I'll get back to you with, with a few questions uh, specifically on US Georgia uh, during the Q&A session. Um, uh, now let me go uh, to Dr. Katuna Bukadze, my uh, colleague at uh, colleague of mine at uh, Katuna did uh, uh, various uh, studies at various times at the Fletcher, uh, Tuff, uh, uh, MIT, uh, um, Harvard. So she's she comments uh, quite uh, regularly on U.S. Uh, and Georgia. Uh, partnership. Uh, so, in my view, she is the best person to give us a coverage. Uh, to sum up, you know where do we stand in that with respect. So, Katuna, the floor is yours, and I'm very pleased to have you here. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for this opportunity. Uh, I'm delighted and honored to speak about the uh, Georgia Strategic Partnership. Uh, as a strategic partner, the United States uh, strongly supports. Uh, uh, Georgia. The Charter on Strategic Partnership represents central framework between uh, Georgia and the United States, and this is the bilateral uh, uh, framework uh, that aims to expand uh, cooperation across a broad spectrum of mutual priorities. The U.S.-Georgia strategic partnership has uh, not only strong political grounds, uh, but uh, it has also a uh, uh, it uh, has uh, also a very strong legal uh, framework, and this legal framework includes agreements for promoting and enhancing cooperations in the fields of security, defense, democracy, protecting human rights, uh, and other fields. Let me explain why uh, the United States matters for Georgia and why Georgia matters for the United States. The US uh, strategic partnership is essential for different reasons. First, the United States is a stronger supporter of Georgia's territorial integrity. In this regard, I would like to emphasize consolidated uh, 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 Consolidated Appropriations Act uh, that uh, includes uh, very important provisions uh, that guarantee uh, Georgia's uh, uh, territorial integrity and effective implementation of non-recognition policy. More precisely, uh, precisely, Consolidated Appropriations uh, Act is banning the U.S. government uh, from uh, uh, financially uh, helping governments uh, that recognize uh, uh, the independence of uh, the Russian Federation uh, occupied Georgian territories of Abkhazia and Svinwali region. Uh, uh, in addition to this, uh, the Secretary of Treasury shall instruct uh, the U.S. directors of the uh, international financial institutions to oppose the financing of any program that uh, violates uh, Georgian territorial integrity. And of course, for us, it's uh, uh, very important uh, uh, conditions in order to provide uh, Georgia's territorial integrity and political independence. Second, the United States supports uh, uh, democracy uh, in Georgia. Uh, the United States uh, 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 gives uh, real opportunities to the government of Georgia to finalize uh, uh, reforms uh, in uh, different fields and consolidate political institutions. Uh, the United States and Georgia uh, ex uh, together work uh, to provide good governance by increasing transparency and accountability uh, of uh, executive branch, legislative uh, process, expanding citizen and media access to uh, government deliberation. Third, uh, uh, the United States and Georgia uh, intend to expand the scope of uh, their ongoing defense and security cooperations in order to defeat uh, threats, including uh, global threats. The United States supports uh, 
efforts of the uh, of, of the Georgian government in terms of implement reforms in the field of security and defense and to meet NATO uh, standards. First, uh, the United States and Georgia uh, intend to support economic market reforms and the United States facilitates uh, Georgia's integration into the global economy as well. Uh, and uh, uh, as for the United States, uh, why uh, Georgia matters for the United uh, States. Uh, first, uh, Georgia uh, sits at a crucial geographical and cultural crossroads, and it has proven itself to be strategically important. Second, Georgia is able to make a significant contribution in the process of ensuring international peace and security. The United States recognizes Georgia's efforts uh, uh, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, well, we uh, have almost 900 troops uh, in Afghanistan and is the largest uh, uh, non-NATO uh, troop contributor to the NATO training mission. And of course, uh, we have a very important progress in terms of Euro-Atlantic integration as a country of the Black Sea region. Uh, at the same time, I would like to talk about the dynamics of um, uh, our relationship, uh, uh, relations in the time of coronavirus. In the time of coronavirus, the United States uh, has uh, expressed uh, its support for Georgia. The United States continues uh, uh, to provide assistance to help us to respond to COVID emergency. Uh, the United States contributes to the um, uh, economic recovery as well. For example, members of the American Chamber of Commerce have uh, donated uh, uh, millions of uh, lorry to the Stop COVID-19 uh, fund. Uh, in uh, the global crisis, uh, the support of the United States uh, makes, uh, it, uh, makes it clear that uh, uh, it's standing by Georgia and uh, uh, it's making a significant contribution to help us to overcome uh, health, uh, economic, uh, social and other challenges. Over the uh, two decades, uh, USAID programs aim to help us uh, to uh, build the democracy, to create economic possibilities, to improve healthcare, education, and other fields. And all this indicates uh, that uh, the support of the United States, of course, is important for us both in times of uh, uh, peace as well as in times of crisis. As for the future priorities of strategic partnership, uh, in spring of 2020, President-elect uh, Joe Biden uh, published his article, uh, Why America Must Lead Again. And uh, in his article, President-elect Joe Biden underlined importance of NATO. He emphasized that NATO is at the very heart of uh, America's national security. Uh, and uh, for us, it's so important because uh, for us, uh, a real um, uh, guarantee of security is uh, uh, membership uh, uh, and integration into NATO. And for us, uh, accelerating process of uh, NATO integration uh, is is really crucial. And of course, we appreciate bipartisan support in terms of Euro-Atlantic integration and other fields as well. I strongly believe that uh, uh, our relations will enhance and bring new initiatives in terms of enhancing uh, our uh, partnership in the fields of security, defense, democracy, and other fields. Uh, I think that it would be essential to focus uh, on uh, six key priorities, continuing uh, support Georgia's territorial integrity first, uh, second support continued uh, development of democracy in Georgia, uh, a third one uh, 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 support Georgia's uh, uh, membership into NATO, uh, uh, support uh, Georgia's uh, defense and um, 
uh, uh, re uh, defense and security reforms uh, more intensively in order to provide uh, uh, resilience, uh, deterrence, uh, and especially enhancing cybersecurity capabilities, assisting Georgia to counter Russian disinformation and propaganda. And of course, it's so important to uh, start negotiations on a free trade agreement. I think that uh, this uh, uh, free trade agreement would encourage uh, uh, more American investment uh, in uh, Georgia and increase the number of American tourists. And of course, uh, uh, this will enhance uh, security cooperation as well in the future. Overall, uh, of course, multidimensional cooperation with the United States will assist, uh, will assist us to achieve our goals on the Euro-Atlantic path and uh, will enhance our ties. Thank you, Katona. We've got, thank, thank you so much indeed. We've got a good feeling where do we stand uh, when we speak about bi bilateral bonds and bi bilateral partnership. Your uh, reminder about the free trade agreement was extremely helpful because that's the next stage or the milestone stage uh, when promoting our uh, uh, partnership. Uh, thank you very much indeed. So, uh, uh, Dr. White, a question to you. Definitely uh, 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 an issue of US foreign policy. It's a huge matter. It's a huge topic. Uh, and let me get closer to the issue of, of, of Georgia, uh, US-Georgia relationships in particular, since we definitely, for obvious reasons, care about uh, our bilateral partnership in the first instance. Um, there are, again, many issues and many sub-issues, so let me pick, uh, a, sort of, you know, a relatively broader question. But that broader question uh, takes us to the to responding to enhancing our bilateral ties. Um, Dr. White's a special challenge, uh, from my understanding, for, uh, for my understanding, uh, a special challenge for United States and international law is for their partners in the region, and in the Black Sea region in particular, such as Georgia is, to charter their foreign policy course without undue interference by their neighbors. And when we speak about interference by, the, by, by our neighbors, um, definitely we have a Russian strategy in the first place. And when speaking about Russian strategy, which has, uh, which has uh, various options uh, to interfere in its, uh, with, 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 with their neighbors. But in the first place, that strategy, to my understanding, is uh, very heavily premised on uh, a faith accompli principle. Uh, that being said, do you think that it's time to work out a new containment policy? And how do you see a new policy or implementing that new containment policy for more effectively supporting or preventing or substantially mitigating such interference, especially based on, on, on fait accompli, you know, which is so much present uh, in the breakaway provinces of Georgia, and not just in the Georgian case, but uh, we can uh, take a few other countries as well. So what, what is your take? You know, would military presence uh, be helpful to fend off, you know, or any regional hub and spoke defense model? What is your take on the, on the, on the issue, please? If you can expand a bit uh, on my question. Sure, so you are correct in pointing to the state of company, uh, process as a problem. The, the U.S. and its allies have been successful in averting Russian and Chinese uh, conventional military aggression against uh, themselves and some partners, where they've been less successful under the Trump administration, the Obama administration previously, is this these kind of sub conventional state a complete seizure. So we have the, you know, what Russia has been doing in, in the occupied territories of Georgia or moving borders there, there. Um, what happened in Crimea and, in, and somewhat in Eastern Ukraine. And then what the Chinese are doing in the South China Sea by creating these artificial islands and militarizing them. You know, these uh, actions have not been sufficient to trigger a kind of NATO Article 5 response. It wouldn't really be, uh, you know, it just, it doesn't, it's not, it's, it's too difficult to, and not credible to try and get all the allies to 
announced that they will use force to return Crimea to Ukraine or force the Chinese off the occupied islands. Um, so this is a struggle. I, I think that the current administration, the Trump administration, has made a lot of success in reprioritizing, particularly the Black Sea. I think we've seen a lot more uh, U.S. national security interests in the region. We've seen much more active naval presence. We've seen NATO itself moving to address the issue. Um, I think the Biden team will continue that, but we still haven't found a good model for dealing with um, sudden seizures after they occur. So the best strategy is just trying to prevent them from occurring, which in addition to the military measures I mentioned includes, of course, ensuring that um, Ukraine and Georgia are strong, powerful states, that they um, are, are, are governed by good civil rights, lack of corruption, um, free, freedom of uh, given, given enough resistance within society to resist um, any efforts to, to influence uh, groups within them to turn them against the, the governments. And also it requires strengthening their economy. So the free trade agreement we discussed earlier is a good, it's a good idea. EU probably should play a greater role there. I think that would be something that the, the um, Biden team will try and push the EU do is just to be, pay more attention and provide more resources to its partners in the East. Um, but it's still a tough problem. Thank you. Thank you. That's been very helpful. So, uh, Dr. Carfano, when speaking about global competition, although we say global, but definitely it could not be, a, I mean, a global in a direct sense of, of globality. And when we speak about global competition, we primarily focus um, from U.S. perspective on U.S. and China and in the Pacific and U.S. and Russia and Eastern Europe. Uh, based on your various articles, statements, and opinions on the importance of the Black Sea region. How the centrality of the Black Sea region surfaces when we speak about US-Russia in Eastern Europe. Uh, we saw uh, enhancing uh, various defense and security measures in that respect, but how do you see, uh, how do you envisage a prospect of uh, bringing them to the next qualitatively new level? Uh, should we expect um, uh, within the next years uh, a, a sort of you know, substantially new approach in that respect, or should we still be speaking about more sort of you know? Should we expect more, if I may so more uh, more sort of you know, uh, support from peripheries rather than from inside? So, your your uh, your observations, please. Uh, yeah. Let me emphasize on Georgia, please. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I did, if I could, just want to pivot back to the trade question yeah, for just sure. a moment, because it's also an issue that we at the Heritage Foundation follow very, very closely. And of course, we have always been enormously supportive of a Georgian um, U.S. free trade agreement. Uh, I think the reality under the Trump administration is they very much prioritize the the uh, FTAs on perceived economic benefit. So there was a, um, uh, and, and there's a bandwidth issue. So very much uh, US, UK was the top of the, uh, their interest and then um, other countries were kind of further down. Um, and, and there wasn't really much concern at all about um, the, the Kind of the geopolitical implications of FTAs, right? They this this administration purely looks at FTAs as an economic deal. Is it what's the cost benefit there? Uh, and they put the politics aside, which I, I wouldn't argue with that. Um, but I would say I think there are in, in a different administration, people might look more at the, the the political value of FTAs, and so a country that might be further down the list, say like a Georgia or a, or a Taiwan, uh, might get more, more attention because of the geopolitical importance of, 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 of signaling of, of trade agreements. We'll see. Um, look, I think there's um, a lot of, mo on the Black Sea, I think there's been a lot of momentum in the US about understanding 
the importance of the security of uh, the NATO frontier, um, not just in, in Central Europe, but that, uh, that the entirety of the NATO frontier, uh, and that includes not just physical se security, but political solidarity, uh, confidence in infrastructure, issues like 5G, et cetera, that um, this is something that really required more attention because it was key to the, to the great power competition, both in the case of Russia um, and China. Uh, and so um, you saw more attention to the Nordic region. Um, you know, obviously increased influence or uh, interest in the Baltic area, but we've seen a lot of um, writing, uh, discussion inside government, outside government on the Black Sea area and the importance of that, uh, more discussion on the importance of the southern flank. There's a lot of momentum behind that. I don't think that's gonna change. Um, uh, there's there's a, a really a, a bipartisan wish to really strengthen the ties of the transatlantic community. Um, so I, I suspect in the short term, we'll con continue to move in that direction. I think there are no silver bullet answers and I think everybody realizes that, but if this administration's done some you know, good things in, with Romania and some of the bipartisan partnerships and my, my guess is we're probably going to pick up on some of that. You know, I do, I do think it's worth stating that um, this, the American elections largely turned on domestic issues. And it's very, very likely that the U.S. president, whoever they are, um, their first 18, 24 months are going to be heavily focused on delivering on the domestic agenda, dealing with COVID and everything else, uh, you know, which is particularly difficult if there's a, a divided Congress. That most likely means on many of the, the big foreign policy hot button issues, um, they're gonna you know, address you know, a few of them. So for example, a Biden presidency would be interested in rejoining the World Health Organization and, and rejoining the Paris Accords and uh, maybe you know, starting on the path to dealing with JPCOA, but you know, in a number of areas, I think that it's very likely that regardless of who the president is, we're going to rely on the momentum that we are. So the, the, it's been a long answer, but the answer is, is there is a lot of interest in the U.S. in a bipartisan manner at this point on Black Sea security. So if there's a time to engage, bring new ideas to the table, bring creative solutions out, uh, talk about renewed commitments, but this is absolutely the right time to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carafana. So as I understood, uh, uh, in relation to the Black Sea, uh, and likewise, uh, in relation to many questions, there is no grand strategy, but the emerging strategy, you mentioned a few times, you know, the momentum, the importance of momentum, and momentum clearly fits with the emerging strategy, rather than the grand strategy. So uh, I very much hope that that momentum will become, you know, uh, ripe uh, enough to substantiate, you know, the support which we are getting from the United States and make, make that support, you know, more meaningful when it comes to the Black Sea and Georgia. So, uh, uh, Dr. Burkhazza, one question to you, please. Uh, as you mentioned, the U.S.-Georgia strategic partnership includes a broad spectrum of issues. Uh, still, uh, your uh, sort of, you know, the, the sum of assessment of the dynamics of the U.S.-Georgia relations in the recent years, if I may. Uh, thank you for this question. Uh, as for uh, dynamics of the U.S. Georgia strategic partnership, uh, I would like to emphasize that in uh, uh, 2019, uh, the United States and Georgia celebrated the 10th anniversary of uh, uh, the strategic uh, partnership charter. Uh, they uh, adopted a joint declaration. It reviewed all main areas of uh, strategic cooperation, including uh, defense, security, uh, people to people relations, trade issues, uh, and um, uh, other important uh, fields for our relationship uh, relations. 
uh, at the same time, of course, uh, I would like to em emphasize uh, bipartisan support because uh, in October, uh, uh, Georgia Support Act was passed by the House of Representatives and it's very strong political support uh, of, of, of for uh, us. Uh, at the same time, of course, uh, the United States uh, is a stronger supporter of uh, Georgia's Euro-Atlantic uh, aspirations, and we have very close cooperation in this regard in order to meet NATO standards. Uh, in 2016, uh, the United States and Georgia signed a framework agreement in order to enhance, the, uh, in order to enhance uh, security cooperation. Uh, and in 2019, uh, this uh, agreement uh, was renewed again. One of the key uh, areas of our military cooperation is a Georgia Defense Readiness Program. And this program and other activities in the framework uh, of a defense and security cooperation aim to enhance Georgia's defense capabilities, to implement institutional reforms, uh, and to improve uh, uh, the level of uh, readiness uh, of uh, Georgian defense forces. Uh, and of course, uh, I strongly believe that uh, uh, these uh, rela uh, relations uh, will be enhanced uh, by uh, both parties uh, uh, in the upcoming years as well in the different uh, fields. Thank you, Katona. So uh, Dr. Weitz and Dr. Carfano, one closing question and the one and same question to you. Uh, well, because of many, because of many circumstances, uh, from my perspective, from the Georgian perspective, uh, Georgia and, and our region, our small part of the world, is the safer to look when it comes to Black Sea, but, but not just to the Black Sea, but to the southern flank of the Eastern uh, Europe and the Middle East, especially when taking into account uh, quite a bumpy relations of the United States with Turkey. So I think that the Georgian issue, when it comes to security and regional stability and regional order, it's a much broader issue than just about Georgia and just about US-Georgia relationships. That's one point. The second point, which I'm always emphasizing with all, all my appreciation, our appreciation, the United States has invested so heavily into the Georgian democracy over many, many years that resilience of Georgian democracy and success of Georgian de democracy, it's, it's also about the soft power of the West uh, democracy in the region. And by, by having successful uh, reforms in Georgia, it, 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 it triggers you know, a spillover effect for the region. So if we take you know, the broad angle, and that's my, uh, that was my <laughs> remark you know, as, as, as of the moderator of the session, uh, uh, again, you know, probably an intriguing question, but uh, intrigue always comes uh, at the very last moment. What would be your sort of, you know, quick advice for the next administration uh, of United States? And also, it's, it's quite interesting for me, what would be your advice to Georgian stakeholders to make those ties more meaningful, more substantial, more realistic, more profound. So uh, could you please, you know, just from top of your head, you know, provide with your uh, responses to this quite complicated question, but something, you know, which is really of great interest to us. I think the war we just saw between Armenia and Azerbaijan certainly confirms your observation that Georgia-US relations, Georgian security requires a, 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 a better a more benign neighborhood, or at least you know, with a more benign neighborhood, it can, can function better. Um, I think that that was a, a prior to the current administration trying to work uh, with particularly some of the Black Sea states uh, to bind to build out ties uh, to uh, countries further to the east. Um, Turkey has been a big challenge in this equation for the Europeans, for the Trump administration. I think it's going to remain a problem uh, for the Biden administration. Um, and there's no easy answer to that one. I think that with respect to Georgia itself, I'm pretty sure the current administration will push for 
further uh, uh, political and economic reforms throughout the region. But in this regard, Georgia is pretty in a good position. I think that Georgia has made a lot of progress in democratic transition to tend the Cold War, certainly economic reforms. I mean, Jim can tell us more, but I know they always rank high in heritage's index of economic freedom. Um, so I think maybe a good way for Georgia to contribute to this is to try and share their expertise and insights with the new Biden team if they come in, not only on how to strengthen democracy and, and economic prosperity in Georgia, but perhaps in some of the neighboring countries as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. White. Dr. Carafano, please. Yeah, well, um, it is an intriguing question. Um, and uh, what actually was, was kind of triggered my response was actually a, a comment that you made when you kind of look at Georgia's long-term uh, strategy, which has really been that uh, the security and prosperity is in integrating into the European, the larger European community. Um, so, uh, you know, obviously, I, I don't know exactly what the next administration will be like, but I guess my advice would be is don't think in terms of a single administration. Uh, think in terms of the long-term strategic engagement with the United States and what makes sense regardless of, of who um, the president is. And I, I think there's two components to that. And I, 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 I do believe that they transcend the Trump administration. In some ways, um, you know, we, we, we equate uh, great power competition with Trump because that's the foundational to his national security strategy. Um, but I think the reality is, is that was the general direction that US foreign policy was headed and that there's a large bipartisan consensus of that. So I think there's two things. Um, there, there are, uh, you know, for some countries, how you handle that is, you know, like a, the Bangladeshis of the world, it's about balancing. You're never gonna get China out. So the way you maintain independence as you, you try to get the Japanese and the Americans and the Indians in Sri Lanka. I think Serbia is probably another good example. Serbia is never going to exclude itself of, of um, Russian and Chinese influence. But if the Serbians want to maintain a true degree of independence, they're going to insist that the Europeans and the Americans are in as equal partners and so that there's a balance of influence there. I, I don't think that's true for Georgia. I think Georgia is fundamentally in the camp of the free world. And I think um, there's uh, there's three things, you know. We believe in we believe in in human rights. We believe in freely elected governments, uh, and we believe in the free enterprise system. Uh, the Russians, the Chinese Communist Party, they don't believe in any of those things. As a matter of fact, they see those things as obstacles to the expansion of their power and influence. The countries that fundamentally believe in those three things, they have to pick a side. And, and the side is the free world. So the first thing I would say is, I think George has picked a side. Um, I would never waver in that. That's one. Uh, the second thing is, uh, I, even in this administration, which often gets attacked for like not liking allies and everything else, we've actually seen a strengthening of many bonds. And in, in part, that is because not just that we picked a side, but People have brought things to the table. And I would I always point to Romania, I think is a very good example. Um, the, the Romanians, you know, it, it, the, the, the Trump administration said we want people to do more. Countries like Romania stepped up and did more. But the US response to that was to do more with Romania. So it wasn't just like you do more, we'll do less. Because countries stepped up and agreed to do more, the US stepped up and engaged and partnered more with them. And I have to believe that that will continue to be a winning formula, you know, regardless of what the US administration is. If you bring things to the table, um, the, the Americans will not say, great, you handle that, we're out of here. The, what the Americans will do is say, that's great. We will we will match that. We will we will pair with that. I think that's the right storm. I think I'm basically telling you what you've already been doing. Um, I just see that working over the long term, uh, regardless of what uh, US administration we have. And, and I think it's, I, I still think that it is the right strategy for really maximizing security and, and prosperity in the, in, the, in the confrontational um, world in which we live. 
Thank you. Thank you. I've got your points. I've got your point. I think that's your point is clear enough and fair enough. So um, we're getting to the end of our session and our discussions. And uh, frankly, what is clear to me that uh, we all, uh, as it was mentioned on many occasions, are to prepare for generational, generational efforts for a new containment policy in our region. Let's be realistic. And that be a long-term policy, a long-term race. So we don't have to be to cherish ourselves, you know, with idealistic, you know, and illusionary uh, impressions. That's one point. And the second point uh, is that a key element uh, for me uh, when speaking about the effectiveness of that policy is, um, well, definitely, you know, no policy is flawless. Uh, but uh, we should think, you know, of more innovative and bold approaches from both sides. Uh, and it's not just about Georgia, it's about our uh, strategic partner, which is the United States. Uh, when it comes to the zones of, uh, let me put in this way, you know, of still geopolitical uncertainty or not enough certainty. So which, which, which connotation we will pick up, you know, it's a matter of taste, but still, you know, we are an in-between state I personally not disliking it very much this 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 uh, this time, but that's the reality. And I think you know, for winning minds and hearts, it's about building up on Georgian resiliency. It's building up on its security. It's building up on its democracy. And I think you know, when we speak about the United States, you know, it's too much on the stake because for 30 years, U.S. has been standing next to us. And the Georgian case and the successful Georgian case, it's not a Georgian case, not anymore. It's our common case. So I wish all of us, you know, successful journey and successful end uh, on, of the, on this journey. So uh, on my personal behalf and on behalf of Dr. Burkhazi, uh, my huge appreciation to you, Dr. Karafano, Dr. Weiss, you know, for your time and for your contribution to these discussions. I, Hope that this we will have um, further discussions down the road as the situation with, uh, with the new administration becomes more clear in the United States and that the, we, we also expect you know, some developments on, on our side. So I very much hope to meet you again and I wish you and your families and your beloved ones, you know, a good health, peace and prosperity. So take care and thank you to our audience for their patience and attention. Thank you so thank much. You. Indeed. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.